My name's Angelo and welcome to We Want Picks. I'm going to break down the entire UFC Vegas 86 fight card, giving you my picks, predictions, and DraftKings plays. But before I do, let's look at the wild success that our premium member community has had playing DraftKings Fantasy. We have put up over $423,000 in winning tickets from DraftKings Fantasy. All of these people have full access to our full suite of tools, including the DraftKings Optimizer. This will literally build lineups for you. You click a few buttons and it automatically will build one lineup. It'll build 150 different lineups for you that you can then enter into different tournaments, large or small, to try to join these people to win all of this money. This optimizer is preloaded with the best DraftKings ownership projections on planet Earth. This is an objective fact. This is not made up. This is not an opinion. It's an actual fact. You can see the last column to the right. Those are We Want Picks ownership projections from the last card. Every other column is a different provider. The Osimos, the Roto Grinders, the massive companies, the small ones. And we beat them week in and week out with these ownership projections. And if you don't know anything about DraftKings Fantasy, basically, you come in here, you build a lineup with the fighters. The fighters have different salaries. You have a budget. You build your best six fighter lineup within that budget, and then you compete against other people. These ownership projections go into the optimizer, and then the optimizer says, based off of these projections and these salary points and how many points we think they'll score, here's your lineup. And then you take it and you can win some money. You can unlock the optimizer. You can unlock the ownership projections, the breakdown with the cheat sheet and the cash core, the live dogs and all the write-ups of who you should use where. All of this and so much more is available for only $10 a month. And look, it has paid for itself. WeWantPicks.com. Click become a member at the top. It is only $10 a month. Let's go ahead and break down this card. We have 14 fights to break down. At one point, it looked like it was going to whittle its way down to 12. And that did not happen. They got some short notice opponents, worked its way back up to 14. This is being recorded before the weigh-ins. So obviously, if somebody misses weight and a fight is canceled, well, take that into account. Let's go ahead and break down this card. As always, we will start at the bottom and work our way up to the top. In a surprising spot on the card, they have prospect Daniel Marcos, undefeated Daniel Marcos, opening up this card. And I get it. His last performance was kind of dog shit, if I'm being honest with you. He barely beat Davey Grant. And I was hard on him at first. When I first broke down this card, I was like, dude, you need to beat the brakes off of Davy Grant or you're not that good. And then I went back and I watched, not that fight, because he looked like trash in that fight. I had already rewatched that. He definitely did not look himself. But I watched other Davy Grant fights and I was like, you know what? Davy Grant does give people a hard time. He's a little awkward. He's good enough everywhere to be difficult. So we'll give him a pass on that. But Daniel Marcos is a very good striker. He's got some power. He can be accurate. He does a really good job stringing together combinations while moving forward. He's going to throw everything. One, two, bang, flying knee. So he's very creative on his feet. And as I mentioned, he is coming off of this very close win over Davy Grant where he did sneak in a takedown, but he landed fewer strikes and really wasn't that busy. He has taken on a Richie Lang. A Richie Lang, well-rounded, very gritty, very tough. He has incredible pressure. He will just stay in your face and continue moving forward. He can fight a technical fight or he can just get sucked into a brawl. His striking likes to set up his takedowns. He has about seven takedowns in his UFC career, but he is mostly a striker. He is coming off of this pretty solid, straightforward win over Johnny Munoz, where he had a couple of takedowns, he had a knockdown, but Johnny Munoz is not very good. Daniel Marcos should win this fight. His line is pretty affordable. His DraftKings pricing is not. Daniel Marcos, $9,300. I don't know if he's going to be worth that. Like, he finished Oliveira, so he scored 104 points. Davy Grant, he squeaked out 55 in a win. 55 in a win. And yes, he was more affordable there than he is here. But if we go look at Arichi Lang, this guy is pretty durable. Like, yes, he's been finished before, right? Faraz Zahabi, his brother, Eamon Zahabi, finished him, put him out, got it done. But that was like a flash, super quick knockout. And that's not the norm with Arichi Lang. Arichi Lang is pretty tough, pretty durable. So I don't think Daniel Marcos is going to get him out of there. And if he does, it won't be super early. I don't think Daniel Marcos is going to be worth the $9,300. Then we have Hyder Amel taking on Fernie Garcia. No data here because he is officially making his UFC debut. 
He uh, came off a solid contender series win this past summer. He's an aggressive striker. He's going to walk through fire. He will walk through whatever you put in his face because he wants to be in the pocket. He wants to fight ugly. He's got a solid chin, good power. He sets a really nice pace. Not a very good wrestler, though. But he will work fights to the ground when he gets the opportunity. And on the ground, he's going to throw heavy. He's going to bomb away. He will give up positions, though, because, again, he's not very good on the ground. This is his UFC debut, and he has a very, very short-notice opponent stepping up here. He's got Fernie Garcia. Fernie Garcia, while he does have some UFC experience, it's not good. Three losses in a row. He lost to Journey Newsom, Brady Heisan, and then Rinya Nakamura. The Rinya loss, he had no success there. Rinya just outright, he had no answer for the wrestling. He did have some success in this Brady Highstand fight. He almost finished Brady. And then Journey Newsom had a little bit of success there as well. He's a tough guy. He's a durable guy. He's very gritty. And he's a gamer. Hence all the decisions here. He's pretty well-rounded. He does have a wrestling background. But when he fights, he's mostly striking. He's always taking steps forward. He does a good job moving out of the way if you throw something at him and then he'll counter and fire back. I think Fernie can be a dog. I think Fernie can make this fight and every other fight he's in ugly, but I don't think he's going to beat Hyder. He is stepping up on short notice. He is moving up in weight. Fernie is not at this weight class. He's coming up in weight because it's short notice. I think Hyder is going to be too much. I think his uh, ability to push a pace, his ability to swing wild, his ability to stay in your face, I think it might be too much. Fernie's a dog. I don't expect him to get finished, but I do think Hyder can put up some real points here, potentially get a knockdown, grind, and make some stuff happen. Hyder, very confident in the pick, $8,700. That's a borderline price point for me. It's, it's right there where like, you know what? I'm very confident. It should be dominant. Let's throw him in there. The only thing holding me back a little bit is that Fernie Garcia is a durable guy. If he wasn't durable, then Hyder all day. Then we have Zach Pauga. Trash, frustrating, no sense of urgency. Zach Pauga taking on Bogdan Guskov. And I was pretty harsh on him there because if you go watch his fights, the guy does nothing. He does nothing. He barely beat Jordan Wright who is no longer in the UFC, and I think he lost 87 fights in a row before they cut him. The Mendes Bukowskis fight was just some of the worst trash I've ever seen in my life. And it's not the skills. Zach Peuga does have fight skills. He has good wrestling. He just doesn't use it in the UFC. He's got decent striking. But in the UFC, he has like no sense of urgency whatsoever. He will just hang out with his back against the cage, and then if he wants to take you down, he's going to rock out Pennington hold you against the cage. He's not shooting clean shots. He's not taking real chances. I don't know what Zach Pauga's problem is, but he does seem to have an actual problem. He's taking on Bogdan Guskov. Bogdan Guskov is Jacob's underdog lock of the week, and I get it. This guy's dangerous. Yes, he got smoked by Volkan Ozdemir, but Volkan Ozdemir is good. Volkan Ozdemir is not like some bum that hangs out against the cage and doesn't get his hands going. Volkan will come forward, will be busy, and that's what he did, and he got it done. So I don't think Bogdan losing to Ozdemir says anything about his overall skill set because if you watch every other fight he was ever been in, other than the short-notice UFC debut against a very good guy, he's a heavy-handed fighter. He comes forward. He throws big. He will mix things up. When he's striking, he is fast, and he has some very real power. He will keep his hands low, though, but he's got good footwork and nice combinations. And if he does not get an early knockout or if striking isn't going the way that he wants to, He'll work you against the cage and he'll work in some takedowns. Bogdan is looking for a win. He's coming forward. He's staying busy. He's trying to make something happen. Zach Pauga may be the better, more skilled overall fighter, but he doesn't fight. He doesn't fight. He hangs out. He takes his time. He'll throw one thing. Like it, it's very bizarre. For a guy that almost won the Ultimate Fighter, it is very bizarre to watch him in the cage just be so low volume and so low activity. And you know what? This might be his coming out party and we all look stupid as hell. But I do think Bogdan, or at least let's put this way. I do know Bogdan will come forward and try to fight. I have to pick the fighter in this matchup. So Bogdan's going to be the pick and $7,800 is pretty affordable for a guy that will pick you up and slam you or try to take your head clean off your body. Bogdan's the pick. Zach Poga, probably the more skilled fighter, but three fights in the UFC. He only has one win. That guy's not in the UFC anymore. And in none of those fights did he have any sense of urgency whatsoever. Then we have Jeremiah Wells taking on Max Griffin. This is a, I don't want to say a controversial fight, but people are pretty split here. And I get it. And I'll break down why I get it in a second. But 
First, let's talk about Jeremiah Wells. He's a little older. I think he's 37. But you know what? Max Griffin's old as well. So age won't really matter here. Jeremiah Wells is going to come forward, throw big, heavy punches, not with like clean technique, but they are fast. And he is firing those things. He will knock you clean out. He knocked out Court McGee. And Court McGee, historically, it was impossible to knock out. And Jeremiah Wells, bang, knocked him out. That's how much power Jeremiah has. But he's also a very insanely high-level grappler. Very good BJJ black belt. Very aggressive, but also not a nerd about it. He'll shoot real takedowns. He's not pulling guard, not getting all sad and pathetic. He will bomb away in his feet and then shoot real. I'm going like this, like Richard Nixon. Anyway. He will bomb away in his feet and shoot very real takedowns. And he will do it over and over. His cardio will slow down just a touch, but not enough to be of concern. Yes, Carlson Harris did just submit him. But he beat the brakes off of Carlson Harris for two and a half rounds. Just beat the shit out of him. Was winning that fight. Takedown after takedown. Control after control. Ten minutes, almost ten minutes, nine and a half minutes of control time in a fight that didn't go the distance. And then in the third round... Made a mistake, lost the situation, boom. Carlson Harris, also a very high grappler, caught him in something. Okay, that was his first UFC loss, 4-0 and leading up to that. The Semmelsberger fight is what gives me all the confidence in the world. Jeremiah Wells was almost knocked out cold twice in the first round, dropped bad. Some referees may have stopped it. In this case, the fight was not stopped. Jeremiah was able to shake off the cobwebs, come out, and then win the next two rounds to win this fight. So Jeremiah Wells, and actually won the second half of the first round as well, which is why it wasn't a 10-8 in the first round. So Jeremiah Wells, we know, is tough. We know he can hang. We know he can take his beating, if you will. He's taking on Max Griffin. This is where I understand why people might be on the Max Griffin side. I do not think it's a wise bet, though. Max Griffin tried and true. He has been around forever. Let's scroll all the way back. 2016 official debut. Coven Covington finished him. Outside of that, you're going to be hard-pressed to find another finish on here because that's not who Max Griffin is. This guy is tough as hell, and he hits like a freight train. He's got eight knockdowns in the UFC. Eight knockdowns in his UFC career. That's a lot, if you didn't know. Max Griffin is durable. Max Griffin is tough. He's got some big power in his hands. He can grapple as well. He's averaging almost two takedowns per fight. I just don't think he's going to win this fight. If Matt Semmelsberger landed the cleanest punches he could ever land and it didn't get Jeremiah out of there, I don't think Max Griffin is going to be able to. Jeremiah Wells is probably going to take him down over and over and over and control the fight. Jeremiah Wells will swing wild, close the distance, take him down. Swing wild, close the distance, take him down. It'll be a decision, most likely. It'll be a decision because Max is so tough. Jeremiah will slow down, might even lose the third, might even lose the first half of the first. But Max does start to lose his power as fights go on. I think Jeremiah Wells gets this done. I'm pretty confident in Jeremiah Wells. I totally understand people being on the on the Max side, but that's more about their confidence in Max being tough than it is in his skill set. And I can't pick somebody just because they're tough and hope for a wild one-punch kind of situation because... As I mentioned 100 times already in this breakdown, we have seen Jeremiah Wells take that big wild one punch, get almost put out, resurrect himself like Jesus Christ, and then come back and win the rest of that fight. So Jeremiah Wells is going to be the pick, and I think he will probably be in my lineup. But like the only thing that worries me is let's look at the Carlson Harris fight. Nine and a half minutes of control time, three takedowns. He put up 44 points. Fine, let's say he ended up winning that fight. That's 74 points. 74 points doesn't cover the salary. That's the one thing that worries me. But then we look at this fight here. Again, Semmelsberger, six takedowns, 11 minutes of control. So if it looks like the Semmelsberger fight and Max is just keep standing up, keep standing up, then Jeremiah Wells will put up some real numbers. So I think he's a borderline guy at the price point of the $8,500, but I, I'm probably going to have him in there because... I know for a fact, at least, at the very least, I can trust him to wrestle, get some takedowns and some control. Then we have Devin Clark versus Marcin Prochnow. This might be a boring fight. This might be fireworks. Neither one of these guys are insanely high-level guys, but they're both pretty tough, and they're both pretty well-rounded. Devin Clark, solid grappler, 
pretty good striking as well. Doesn't have the greatest chin in the world, but he's got some good footwork and he has heavy hands. He wants to crowd his opponents, drag you to the ground. Once it's on the ground, he's going to look for a TKO more than he is a submission. This Kennedy and Chuck Wu fight, don't let this fool you. Don't say, oh, second round submission. This guy. He almost had Kennedy out cold. He almost put Kennedy away. Kennedy was able to survive and made it happen, but Devin Clark showed us that he is dangerous and he's insanely tough. Taking on Marcin Prochniow. This guy has over 400 combat karate wins. Not just fights, but wins. A very long list of accomplishments. His MMA style, he wants to come in, he wants to brawl. He wants to stay in your face and brawl. He has no problem getting into a firefight. The problem, though, is that his chin won't always allow him to be in a firefight. He does have incredible power, but he is pretty much KO or bust. Devin Clark most likely avoids getting KO'd drags Marcin to the ground over and over again and grinds out what is likely to be a somewhat boring win. If we look at Devin Clark, $8,900, we're going to need a lot of dragon, and he has only ever covered that salary one time, two times, three times, <laughs> three times in his UFC career. Jake Collier, when he had four takedowns, Rodriguez, seven takedowns, damn. And then ba -ba -da, two takedowns and a finish over William Knight. But I mean, William Knight is no longer here. So Devin Clark, $8,900. I think there's probably some more confident fighters at that super upper echelon of pricing on this card. But if he gets 100 takedowns and a potentially a finish, then all of a sudden he is worth it. We have Loma Look Boomy at $9,400. Don't spend that money. Okay, this is a hard no. I love Loma. I think Loma wins this fight. I think Loma is insanely talented. She's a Muay Thai striker who has phenomenal takedowns in that Muay Thai clinch. And she will fight her little ass off. And little is the key word there. She's only five foot one. And I think that's an exaggeration. She is tiny. She hits hard. She's dangerous. Very skilled Muay Thai practitioner. And as I mentioned, has worked in takedowns really well into her game. But the only real finish we've seen from her is the beating of Elise Reed, and she only put up 89 points there. The only time she ever covered this $9,400 salary point is by one single point against Denise Gomes, where she had four takedowns and seven minutes of control. She is not going to cover her salary here. She just isn't. $9,400 is a lot of money. And the way DraftKings does their salaries, they don't do the salary based off of how much they think somebody's going to score using their scoring system. They do the salaries based off of do we think this person's going to win? Yes. And they think she's going to win convincingly. So $9,400. That doesn't translate to the DraftKings scoring system well enough for me to spend that money. I do think she wins. She's fighting Bruna Brazil. Bruna Brazil's pretty tough. She's not a bum. She is pretty tough. She's a striker. She has some very real power. And she is creative on her feet. She'll throw Superman punches, spinning back kicks. She wants to march forward. And I will just enjoy the show. Because she marches forward and she will throw everything. But she could also play that game on the outside. Stay in the outside. Bing, bang. Stay in the outside. Bing, bang. Or she could big sister here. So while I do think Loma is going to be the better fighter, I think she's going to win. I think she'll cloud. I think she'll get the clinch going. Brunna is much larger. And the big sister component here is what worries me a little bit. I'm not going to throw Brunna in my lineup either at $6,800 because that's sort of a flyer. The only way she wins this fight, in my opinion, is staying on the outside and hiding. Now, she could try to big sister Loma, but in order to big sister her and toss her around and ragdoll her, she needs to close the distance and will end up in clinch-type situations, and Loma shines in the clinch. Loma's going to be the pick. I'm not spending that money in DraftKings uh, Fantasy. Then we have Balaji Oki taking on a short-notice opponent in Timothy Kwamba. Balaji Oki, no data here because he is making his official UFC debut after an impressive knockout on the Contender Series this past summer. This guy's a busy striker. Good jab, tons of power. He wants to pump that jab, pump that jab, and set things up, and he will explode into combinations when he has the opening. He's got good takedown defense and insanely fast sprawl. His hips are gone. You shoot on him, like, boom. They, his hips are way behind him, and he's stuffing that head. Phenomenal takedown defense. He's going to be the far more dangerous fighter $9,500, he's probably worth it. He's taken on Timothy Kwamba. Timothy Kwamba, no stats here. Not only is this his UFC debut, he just fought like four days ago. 
He just fought four days ago. This past summer, he fought on the Contender Series. He won that fight. It just wasn't exciting. It wasn't enough for the UFC to say, yeah, let's sign this guy. Then, just last week, less than a full week ago, he fought in tough enough, smoked some regional guy. Good for him. And then he got the short notice call up and he took it. He is going up in weight though. Skill-wise, he's also a pretty talented striker. Good takedown defense, fast hands, decent power for his weight class. This is not his weight class. And I think size matters very, very much. I think Bellagio is going to hit too hard, be too prepared, be too ready to go. Timothy just fought last week. I don't know Timothy personally. I don't know how he lives his life. Maybe he's a uh, clean eating, organic vegan. I don't know. But I would assume that after he just beat somebody on a regional show back home, he knocked a few back, ate some shit, and relaxed until he got a phone call on Tuesday afternoon saying, do you want to fight in the UFC? And now it's Friday, and all of a sudden he's got to put everything together. So he's going to be small, zero training whatsoever. Like immediately had to hop on a plane. Like I, I appreciate Timothy stepping up, and we all know what the UFC does, right? You did me a favor, we'll do you a favor. Who cares if you lose, you'll get another fight. So good for Timothy, got his UFC call up, but it, I don't think it's going to go well for him. I think Bellagio wins, and I think he covers his salary. Then we have Carlos Prates taking on Trevin Giles. Carlos Prates, another contender series guy that got a nice knockout and earned himself a slot. And it's the beginning of the year, so we're going to see that. All these contender series guys just fought in the summer. Now it's the beginning of the year. They're going to, you know, six months out, four or five months out, they're going to start to get their shots and that's what we're seeing on this card. Carlos Prates, dangerous striker. He's almost like an Alex Pajeda. Not Doesn't have the accomplishments, doesn't have the skills, certainly has the fucking tattoo. It says Muay Thai in giant letters across his chest. So I think we know exactly how this guy is going to fight. But he does keep his hands low. He's got that wide stance. He plots forward. He will kick you everywhere. He'll kick your head. He'll kick your body. He'll kick you like on a dime. That leg is boom, blasting you. Phenomenal kicks, very good power. His hands are low, so he can get hit himself, and that might be a problem for him because he is fighting Trevin Giles. Trevin Giles is not great anywhere, but he has insane athleticism and quite literally maybe the best jab in the UFC, at, at least top three jabs in the UFC. He pumps it, he fires it, and he sticks with it. It stays in your face. Boom, 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 boom. He beat Roman Delize with a jab, only a jab. He's got a lot of fights in the UFC. He's been around for a while, fought a lot of people. But when he loses, he loses. Finish, 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 finish. Trevin Giles, well-rounded guy, good enough skills everywhere, does have a, I don't want to say a quit button because he's not quitting, but does get finished in those losses, both submission and knockout. Phenomenal jab, and that jab might be a problem for the far less experienced Carlos Prates. But Carlos hits so hard. Those kicks are so dangerous. I think, think he wins here. And I do think he wins by finish. Potentially breaks Trevin Giles. So Carlos Prates, I'll take him at $9,200 over, who did I say was not worth the $8,900? Devin Clark. I would trust Carlos Prates for a couple more bucks there and his upside. Then we have Rodolfo Vieira taking on Armin Petrosian. This fight was booked a few months ago. And then Armin Petrosian accused, true statement, accused Rodolfo Vieira and his team of poisoning him. He said he was poisoned. And then he worked that poison through his body. He did an exorcism. The poison has left his body, and now he is good to go. And this fight is rebooked. We got Rodolfo Vieira, world-level grappler. World-level grappler. Has beaten some of the best grapplers on planet Earth. I think his nickname is the Black Belt Hunter. I don't know why it says none here. I'm pretty sure that's his nickname. It's like a Sakuraba-type nickname. And if you know who Sakuraba is... Congratulations, you're as big of an MMA fan as I am. Anyway, Rodolfo Vieira, phenomenal grappler. The knock on him early was his trash cardio. And we did see that in the Hernandez fight. But he made adjustments. He's a high-level athlete. He made adjustments. We have not seen him gas since then. He fought Chris Curtis, Curtis, Chris Curtis in three hard rounds where he attempted like 12 takedowns. He moved forward, didn't slow down, tried to win that fight. Rodolfo Vieira's cardio is no longer an issue. He shoots blast doubles like you dream. He can hit pretty hard. His striking is actually pretty technical and insanely high-level grappler. He's taking on Armin Petrosian. Armin Petrosian's a very good striker himself. Very powerful striker. Super fun. He does have a professional kickboxing background. A bit of a brawler at times, and he relies on his chin a lot. His takedown defense is not very good. 
His scramble skills, though, are very good. You take him down, he pops right back up. And I think that's important here because he can be taken down. And Rodolfo Vieira, I think, will take him down. This is basically an even fight. And the reason it's an even fight is it's a wild clash of styles. Armin's 10 times the striker that Rodolfo is, and Rodolfo's 10 times the grappler that Armin is. I tend to lean grappler. I think it is harder to keep a fight standing than it is to get it to the ground. I think Rodolfo will get it to the ground. I know we can trust his cardio. And ever since that Cody Brundage fight, I know we can trust his guts as well. Cody Brundage dropped that dude bad. Almost twice, I think. If not twice. Dropped him bad. And Rodolfo survived. Gutted. Dig deep. Got that win. And now that we know he can get through that adversity, we've seen him fight three rounds against Chris Curtis. We've seen him fight through some adversity. We've seen him be tough. Now that we know all those things, I think he can survive whatever Armin could potentially throw at him, get it to the ground, and get this win. I like Rodolfo here. I'll spend the money, but certainly if you're on the Petrosian side, if Petrosian wins, it will be by knockout, and he will be worth that money. Then we have Michael Johnson taking on Darius Flowers. Michael Johnson, let me just scroll through here. UFC debut in 2010. He was on The Ultimate Fighter that season. The Ultimate Fighter in 2010 was on Spike TV. That's no longer a network. That's where the UFC started, Spike TV. Well, modern UFC started there. Original UFC was pay-per-view only. Then you'd have to go to Sam Goody to get the VHS tapes once it was banned off pay-per-view. And then they worked their way back. The Ultimate Fighter resurrected the UFC. A lot of resurrection references in this breakdown. Brought the UFC back like a phoenix from the ashes on Spike TV. Fun fact, the first season of The Ultimate Fighter was basically an infomercial. They bought the airtime, meaning it wasn't a TV show with commercials. They asked Spike TV, they said, we will buy one hour a week. Give us one hour a week. We will pay for it. We own that time slot and we'll put this show on there. And that's what they did. Anyway, Michael Johnson fought on it just a few years later. In 2010, it's 2024. 14 years in the UFC fighting some of the highest level guys. Tony Ferguson, Miles Jury, Joe Lozon, Glayson Tabal, Melvin Gillard, Edson Barboza, Benil Dariush, Nate Diaz, Dustin Poirier, Khabib Nurmagomedov, Justin Gagey, Darren Elkins, Andre Feely, Artem Lobov, Josh Emmett, something Ray, Tiago Moises, Clay Guida, Alon Patrick, Jamie Malarkey, Mark DeCasey, and Diego Fajeda. And the Diego Fajeda won for first of all. Huh? I knew all those names except one. Diego Fajeda put his lights out. Put his lights out. One of the worst, the worst knockout of Michael Johnson's career. One of the worst knockouts of 2023. It was bad. And it's unfortunate. But time is a bitch. And time is catching up to Michael Johnson. While he has fought some of the highest level fighters the UFC has had and beaten some of them, Dustin Poirier, he also has a lot of miles on his body. He's a well-rounded guy, lightning fast. Good striking, good take. That, like, very well. He's good everywhere. For a guy that's been in the UFC for 14 years, he's a, what you expect. He is good everywhere. Tons of high-level experience. Never panics. But that button was pressed in that last fight. And unfortunately, you can't unpress some of those buttons. Not at his age. Not at this point in his career. So I do think that knockout was a problem for him. He's fighting Darius Flowers. This guy's an in-your-face guy. High, tight guard. He will march forward. He will bomb away. He will throw heavy punches and then work in big slam style takedowns. Incredibly dangerous, but he is sloppy because he chases. But he's got very good BJJ once the pace eventually slows down. And he's a very good fighter. Jake Matthews beat him. Subbed him on short notice. Not at his weight class. Now he's at his weight class. Now he's fighting... An aging vet that was just out cold. Bad. I do think Darius Flowers gets this done. And this is not because I think Darius Flowers is the better fighter. Michael Johnson is absolutely the better fighter. But age is a number? No. No, age is a number implies that you're fine. Age is not just a number. Eventually the sport catches up to you and I think that's what's happening with Michael Johnson. That knockout at 37 years old was bad. Darius Flowers is going to be the pick. $7,900. The problem is the only way he wins this fight is a knockout. He's not going to outwork Michael Johnson. 
So if we think he's going to get a knockout, then we got to spend that money because he will put up big points. So I personally will mess with my lineup and I'll definitely have some lineups with Darius Flowers in it, but none with Michael Johnson. Because if Michael Johnson wins, he's not a dangerous guy. If Michael Johnson wins, it's going to be a decision, dancing around, lightning fast jabs, stuff like that. He's not going to finish Darius. So Michael Johnson, definitely not worth his price point. Darius Flowers 100% is if he wins. Then we have Gregory Rodriguez taking on Brad Tavares. I don't know what that accent was. Gregory Rodriguez, RoboCop. This guy's very good everywhere. Great power in his hands. He will come forward. Traditionally a pretty good chin and a very good grappler. For a giant chunk of his career, he was all striking. Even though his base is high-level black belt. He converted into a striker. And as we've seen that happen many times, these guys find a knockout, they think they can knock everybody out, and that's what they start doing, chasing knockouts. Well, Gregory Rodriguez was that guy for a little bit. And then Bruno Fajeda found the chin, knocked him out, and then the whole fight week where he was fighting Dennis Tullul, and he said, I'm going to wrestle. I'm going to grapple. I'm a high-level grappler. It's stupid as hell that I haven't grappled. I'm going to grapple. And then he came in here, slammed the absolute shit out of Dennis Tullul, and then TKO'd him. You're going to see TKO. This was not on the feet. Slammed that dude, put him out. Gregory Rodriguez, very good striker, very good grappler, pretty durable guy. Obviously, we've only seen him go to decision twice in the UFC, once against Dusko Totorovic, the other against Armin Petrosian. But he's a pretty durable guy outside of the Bruno connecting. And he's going to need his durability. He's going to need his cardio because he is fighting Brad Tavares. Brad Tavares is not a guy you finish very easily. Bruno Silva finished him, but Bruno Silva might pound for pound be one of the hardest hitters in this division or, or number two to Alex Pajeda, even though Alex moved up a division. But Bruno Silva hits like a freight train and that happened. But Brad Tavares is typically a very durable guy. I mean, he just survived Drikas Duplessis. Brad Tavares has been around for 100 years, similar to the breakdown I just did on Michael Johnson. Brad Tavares has been around since 2010. Hey, The Ultimate Fighter was on Spike TV in 2010. He's been around forever, and he has fought this entire division. I mean, Phil Baroni, what a name. That guy's in jail now for murdering his wife, or maybe it was his girlfriend, but that's not a good look for the sport, and that just happened. Anyway... He has fought some pretty high-level guys. Yoel Romero, Tim Boach. And honestly, Tim Boach is kind of a joke of a name, but that dude had some wild success. Nate Marquardt, Marquardt. That guy fought for a title. It was an embarrassing title fight, but he fought for a title. Robert Whitaker. Kayo Magales. I'm not going to go through that whole list. Anyway, he's fought a who's who. Pretty good striker. All the Hawaiian toughness you could ever want or need from a fighter. Not great wrestling, but it's there. You don't fight for 14 years at the highest level and not have those skills. So Brad Tavares, pretty good everywhere. Skills everywhere. Very durable. I don't think he wins this fight. Certainly he could survive early, but Brad Tavares is not a dangerous guy. He's not knocking anybody out. If he had that big one-punch knockout power, then maybe, uh uh-oh, Gregory was knocked out last year. Uh Uh-oh. But there is no, Brad doesn't have, there's no danger there. His last finish was in two. That oop. His last finish was in 2018. He only has two finishes ever, and that was Jotko. I don't even know if Jotko's still in the UFC. Anyway, Greg Rodriguez is going to be the pick, and that dude puts up numbers. Whether he's grappling, whether he's striking, he puts up numbers. So Greg Rodriguez definitely somebody you should look at for your lineup. Then we have the featured fight of the evening. We have UFC newcomer Robert Burkek. Taking on Ihor Pateria. This is striker versus striker. Robert's the much better striker. Trained boxer. He takes those techniques into the cage. He's very light on his feet. He'll work his way forward and constantly fainting. Like lots of twitch type motions. That that wasn't a glitch. Like, that I'm just, I'm just that good at the twitch faints. Lots of like twitch faint motions to the point where he convinces people he's going to shoot. He goes like this. They lower their lever a little bit, boom, right hand right over the top. Very good at feints, very good clean boxing, very good takedown defense as well, but he can be taken down if you ignore the feinting and just blast right through him. But I don't think takedowns are going to matter in this fight. He's fighting Ihor Pateria. Ihor Pateria is a striker. Pretty good striker, very loose, solid power, good accuracy, but he is hittable. He keeps his hands low. He relies on his chin a little too much. Takedown V defense, boom. Slow it down. Takedown defense is not very good, but he does do a good job of making you pay on the way in. Back to normal speed. 
He's got five fights in the UFC, and in every single one of them, he was losing the striking. Even in his two knockout wins, or one knockout win, the other one was on the Contender Series. Even in his two knockout wins, he was losing the striking exchanges. Watch the fights, look at the stats. He was losing the striking exchanges, and then he found it. I don't think Robert's that guy. I think the UFC knows exactly what they're doing here. They want Robert to win. They put him on the featured fight. It's a fight night, not a pay-per-view, but if his UFC debut is a featured fight. He's a good-looking guy. He's got good hands, and he's fighting somebody that can be put out. They want him to win, and sometimes you just have to trust the process. Robert Bursek is the pick. And potentially worth that $8,800 salary. Co-main event, Dan Ige versus Andre Feely. Dan Ige is very good. Dan Ige is not like this incredibly dangerous guy, though. He is at a low price point where his salary is enticing, but I don't like it. I'm going to leave it alone, even though Andre can be a bit chinny. But Dan Ige, very good kickboxer. He's got good speed, good power. Not insane power, but good power. Solid BJJ and underrated wrestling. He's another one of these guys that has fought everybody. He's fought absolutely everybody, and he is insanely durable. You're not going to see many finished losses on his record because this guy is durable. He's got that same Hawaiian fighting spirit that we get from Brad Tavares. I think he's Hawaiian, right? I'm right there. Yeah, I'm right. I'm right. He's a reliable guy. He's consistent. He has fought the upper echelon of the division for the last couple of years. And anytime he got a tiny step down, he beat the shit out of him. Smoked Jackson. Smoked Landwehr. Anytime he's not in the top 10, Evelov, Emmett, Mitchell, Korean Zombie. Anytime he's not in the top 10, he does what he's supposed to do. And this is not a top 10 opponent. Andre Feely might be top five talent-wise, but actual execution on those abilities He's just not there, and I don't know why. At one point, Andre Feely was the hyped prospect from um, Uriah Faber's gym. What the hell is that called? Alpha Male. He was the hyped prospect from Team Alpha Male. He was Cody Garbrandt 2.0, just like Cody, but faster, just like Cody, but a better chin. And I think my opinion is the UFC pushed him too fast too early. His second fight ever was Max freaking Holloway. I think they pushed him too fast too early, and then it took a little bit of wind out of his sails. You have to build some of these fighters up. Andre Feely, very talented guy. He can wrestle. He can strike. He's got power. He's got great footwork, good timing. And he's a dog. He will hang out and he will swing. As long as his chin holds up, he's a dog. Does it always hold up? No. Joe Anderson Brito showed us all that. But Joe Anderson Brito is a savage. I think Andre Feely's in, insanely talented. Um, he's certainly is better than the salary point here at $7,600. He certainly can squeak out a win. And if Andre Feely won, anybody close to this sport, I don't think they'll be surprised. I think they'll be like, yeah, man, that guy's so freaking talented. Of course he won this fight. Of course, he's so talented. How did we not see it? But can't always trust him to execute on those abilities. You can trust Dan Ige. I don't think Dan Ige's worth that salary though. He's sort of a decision kind of guy. He's finding his spots. He's executing. He's not taking wild chances, not taking wild risks. There's almost no wrestling. So I think Danny Ige wins, and he likely wins a technical striking match. But if Andre Feely comes in here looking to wrestle, mixing things up, then Andre Feely can take that fight. So I'm probably going to leave it alone, but I will have some exposure to Andre Feely in some of my lineups. Then we have the main event of the evening. Joe Pfeiffer, $9,000, taking on Jack Hermanson. There's a lot of people on Jack Hermanson. I mentioned this in my betting breakdown video as well. Go check that out if you want to see our actual bets. A lot of people on Jack Hermanson, and none of them are talking about Jack Hermanson. It's always, I bet on Jack at plus whatever the hell because we've never seen Joe fight past the third round. Because this is the highest ranking fighter Joe has ever fought. So they're all talking about Joe when they're picking Jack. And the reason they're doing that is because nobody thinks Jack's going to be the harder hitter. A lot of people don't think Jack's going to be able to take Joe down at his miserable 29% takedown accuracy. Everybody knows that Joe is probably the better fighter. He hits hard. He can wrestle. He's got high-level grappling training at a very good gym. And people are just banking on the fact that he's a young guy 
and he doesn't have a bunch of decisions, so he might get broken by the old guy. He might slow down as the fight goes on. And I don't see it that way. We have not, There are no red flags. We have not seen a red flag yet. Obviously, there aren't any until there are, meaning if Jack pressures hard and stays alive, then we'll find out what Joe's made of. So we haven't had the fight yet to find out what he's made of, but I haven't seen a red flag. And we know that this guy uses his brain. He fought Abdul Razak Al-Hassan, a very good striker who has a high-level judo background. And Joe Pfeiffer said, and hey, let me just take this guy down. I'm not going to mess with the strikes. And he took him down three times and then submitted him. I think Joe Pfeiffer wins this fight. $9,000 may be worth it. We have five rounds to work with. And he can certainly get a finish. We got Jack Hermanson. Pretty tough guy. You're going to see that Delizze stopped him, but is a different animal. And this was after Delize calf sliced the shit out of him in like eight seconds. Outside of that, pretty durable guy. You got to go back to 2019 Jared Cannonier, the monster of a human being, Jared Cannonier, to find a finish loss for Jack Hermanson. What I will say is I think Jack gets a little too much love for being this high-level guy. He's lost to most high-level opponents. He lost to Delize. He beat Chris Curtis. Chris Curtis didn't do shit. Didn't do a thing in that fight. Chris Curtis just wasn't getting the pressure that he wanted from Jack. It was a boring fight, and then Chris Curtis threw a full-blown temper tantrum. Sean Strickland beat Jack Hermanson. Close decision, but Sean Strickland beat him. He beat Shabazian. Okay. Lost to high-level Vittori. He did beat Kelvin Gastelum in a flash heel hook. Lost to Jared Cannonier. This is his best win of his career, Jacare Souza. But that was an old, worn-out Jacare. David Branch was a high-level BJJ guy that just never really made it. These wins aren't that good. And I'm not trying to disparage his career. I'm trying to point out the fact that saying Joe doesn't have high-level experience and saying Joe hasn't beat anybody high-level and then picking Jack is a bit of a contradiction. Outside of Chris Curtis, Jack Hermanson hasn't beat a high-level fighter. At least not one that was at the appropriate age at the time. Jacare Souza was old and retired. I don't think Jack Hermanson wins this fight. I totally understand the whole, well, we haven't seen Joe tested yet. That is a true statement. But we also haven't seen anything to make us worry about Joe passing a test or not passing a test. Joe is going to be the pick. $9,000 probably worth it. You got five rounds to work with. And that dude hits like a freight train. And we know he can wrestle. Guys, become a premium member. Join this crew of almost three thousand premium members just go to wewantpicks.com click become a member at the top it's only ten dollars a month you're going to unlock the optimizer you're going to unlock the greatest ownership projections in the game you're going to unlock all of our detailed breakdowns not only by tournament type and entry type but also rank all of the fighters by salary by entry type and then this cheat sheet will be populated every Friday afternoon with the ownership projections, the scoring projections, and the leverage plays. All of these numbers are our own, and that's why they're the best in the game. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top.